Welcome back. I'm Tedward, and today, thanks to Bond Group in Waltham, Massachusetts, we're driving a 1957 Porsche 356A Speedster. We've driven a couple Speedsters on the channel before from fully original, unmolested only resealed engines to Will Hoyt hotted up hot rod, kind of almost outlaw Speedsters. And today we've got one that is in good driving condition. She's a little rougher on the edges, which you'll see in the bodywork. But man, oh man, this is Speedster weather. This has an air-cooled flat four push rod engine at 1600 cc's and it probably only makes about 70 to 75 horsepower at best so when you see those will hoyt speedsters that make like 120 horsepower those are like doubling the power of these cars and it's on drum brakes a lot of folks will convert these to disc brakes and although these drums give you a nice initial bite sometimes you want those discs just to withstand the heat of some long long braking from higher speeds either way this car weighs very little it's only about 1700 pounds so 75 horsepower goes quite a long way Growing up, I overlooked 356s in every form because I thought of them as the bathtub Porsche that was driven in Top Gun. I was always a 911 guy, except now, I mean, I'm still a 911 guy, but I have really grown to love these things. Unfortunately, so has the market too found this out because this one, even in this condition, is probably about $300,000. So maybe when I didn't care for them, I should have bought one because it probably would have cost around forty to $50,000. Either way, let's take a closer look. We've got these beautiful headlights. And what I like about a Speedster from this era is when it's not fully restored, when it's got some patina, when there's some signs of life and, 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 and a life lived out of these cars. Inside, this one actually does have lap belts, which we will use when we drive it, but they're very simple. You've just got a four-speed manual gearbox, a steering wheel, and your floor-mounted pedals, very similar to what you'd see in a 911. The carpet on these, you know, that looks pretty original to me. Beautiful seats, and what's wild about these seats is they've got like this wood frame down here, and there's nothing really holding it down but gravity. So you just got it hinged there. That gives you access to your rear kinder seats, which I cannot imagine putting four people in this thing and driving up a hill. And although it does have a roof, you shouldn't put it up because the idea of a Speedster is that you keep that down. Now, the cool thing about the Speedster that was that it was basically designed for California. The idea was that this was going to be the California Porsche because you could you could keep the top down in all weather and that's what we saw in movies like Harper and James Dean raced 356s although he did die in a 550 Spider. In the rear we've got these slightly upgraded style taillights. The Beehive ones came just before this and then our dual exhaust out the center. To pop open that rear hatch we just pull that little guy and that reveals our little four banger with two carbs, one on each side. And it's all very mechanical. It feels great. These are a joy to drive, although they're not quick, but that's the beauty is you can really wind these out. All that power is made only up to about 4,500 RPM. So it's a very low revving little engine. And a lot of folks in the comments are gonna complain that this is just a Volkswagen. Well. I'll tell you what, I've driven 1600 cc Beetles and I would take this Speedster over that any day. Up front, we've got our giant bumper to help protect us and under here will be nice and gentle with these straps. These are not original. Try to keep that from scratching any paint. Then we can release from here. And this reveals our fuel tank and our spare tire as well as the battery. Now, this fuel tank is kind of annoying because that means that any time you need to go get fuel, you have to go through that process and then you have to snake your fuel pump into that tank without injuring your back or scratching the paint. Kind of a pain, but very cool. So let's jump in, throw the earmuffs on for wind noise and take it for an enjoyable little drive. 
Pretty simple stuff to start up our Speedster. We've got our key right here. You'll notice that this oil temp gauge is not functional. It's gonna read all the way up, so don't worry, we're not overheating this car. Jumps right to life with just a little bit of throttle. Now, there is no choke in these Speedsters. However, there is a hand throttle. So this one does not work, but typically what you would do to keep it idling properly is you would turn that on and then just adjust it as needed. But yeah, that's the deal. Our handbrake right here. And in first. Clutch catch is nice and low, very, very speedster-like. That first second gear change is just the best and it starts to give you an idea of how cool Porsche was and how tactile they were even in the 1950s. This gearbox, I would say, is a heck of a lot easier to navigate and get into your desired gear than even the 901 gearboxes that came in the first 911s. But you do want to come pretty much to a complete stop before going for that first gear. We're gripping this great dainty little steering wheel, not wood grain, period correct, with our great little horn. You kind of want to just keep it around that 3000 RPM power band because that's where it's happy. You don't want to lug these engines. And this is exactly what you would do with your Speedster. It's amazing, you, you just feel so connected to this car. Pulling out into traffic in a Speedster gives you a sense of your own mortality for certain. Real big lean into third. But once you get used to it, it's just second nature. It's just a great driver. The steering, obviously no power steering. Very manual, very direct. And I think that's like the most charming part about these speedsters is just knowing that you were directly connected to the road. It does sort of give you the sense that it's like a little tractor engine, but it's a happy little engine and it wants to be opened up. And the car really wants to be pushed into some corners. And what I love about these things is that you could do it at reasonable speeds. I mean, you get into a new GT3 or any Porsche for that matter, even if it's a Macan, to have any fun in it, you need to be breaking the law. You can certainly get away with not breaking any rules and having on limit handling fun in your 356 Speedster. You just gotta pay for it. You gotta pay to play. The drum brakes work, but you need to be aware that they are in fact drum brakes because what you don't want to be doing is you don't want to be dragging them for too long. You want to kind of give them a pump, let them bleed off the speed they can bleed off, and then let them cool down for a second and get back into them. So you don't want to be dragging those down a hill for, for significant periods of time. I love the way this goes into gear. You can really feel it engaging with that transmission in a pleasurable way, not in a grindy way, not in a, ooh, I thunked a, a cog kind of way, but just in a 
very direct and understanding like, yes, I have achieved that year. I am in. There's no question about it. to wax poetic about the past, but there's something to be said about a mechanical throttle linkage that just goes directly to the throttle bodies and opens right when you need it. Of course, of course you can get well-tuned throttle maps and electronic systems today, but there is nothing like feeling it directly on your foot. You actually can feel the drag of that cable or the weight of those springs your foot. Two car solution, Speedster, G-Wagon. And this 1600cc engine is pretty robust. Um, you know, you're not dealing with something that's overly outrageously complicated. You can do sort of roadside repairs if needed, but it's simple. It's a push rod and it's got a fan belt. Uh, if you need to tune the carbs, bring a screwdriver. You know, that's kind of your deal. If you're gaining elevation, you may need to adjust that on your way up the mountain. But Otherwise, this thing's just gonna run and run and run. Keep oil in it. The drivability is just incredible. This is one of the things that I really love about these cars is that kind of anybody with a little bit of mechanical sympathy and know-how can get the job done on one of these. There's plenty of vintage cars that I think are incredibly difficult to drive and you know, kind of just for advanced or intermediate folks. And even then, sometimes you just don't want to go through the hassle. Driving your vintage car should be fun. It shouldn't be a chore. It shouldn't be a thing where you fear entering the next gear, hoping it's the right gear and hoping that it will actually accept your request. I feel like you can either mountain bike or drive at 356 speeds. So these are the two best ways to commune with nature. So thank you guys so much for watching, liking, commenting, and subscribing. 
don't forget to respect the drive and please find joy in the slow cars find joy in the classic because there are a lot of little treasures to be found i mean i don't have 400 grand to go blow on a nice speedster but if i did i know i would have one don't forget to respect the drive and i'll see you in the next one